Hello, I'm Rachel from Dwensa Garden and in this video we visit Sweden in midsummer. Midsummer is the longest day of the year and since pagan times it's been celebrated as a magical night. In Sweden this custom is very much celebrated today and it's even a national holiday. For midsummer, I'm taking you to two beautiful Swedish gardens. Gardens that couldn't be more different from each other. One is the Rosendal Garden, a relaxed, airy space full of scented roses and a kitchen garden that grows delicious produce for the garden's restaurant. The second garden is formal and surrounds the Drottningholm Palace. It dates from the 1600s. The palace is even today the residence of the Swedish royal family. At Drottningholm we'll see many Swedish families celebrating midsummer with a picnic in the palace gardens. Oh, and we might even have time for a little wander in the woods to get a flavour, a taste of the wilder side of Sweden. So come on, let's get on with the video. It's Midsummer's Eve and we're visiting Rosendal Garden. We want to catch it before they close for the annual Midsummer holidays. Now Rosendal Garden is situated on Djur Garden Island, which is an island in Stockholm, the capital city, and it's to the west of Rosendal Palace. Rosendal was founded by the Swedish Garden Association in 1861 when they built a greenhouse and opened a gardening school in this location. Queen Josephina became the garden's sponsor, making the gardening academy possible. The orangery was built in 1848 as the garden's main building. Today it's a private residence. Since 1982, the garden has been run by a foundation whose guiding principle is the dissemination of biodynamic cultivation. They also work to promote landscape art. The garden supports a cafe, bakery, nursery, bread shop and gardening classes. All earnings from these are used to run and further develop the garden. Lunch at the cafe is a real treat with crunchy fresh salad and traditional midsummer fish. I notice many gardening students at work in the gardens, either weeding or tending to vegetables. The growing of organic vegetables is labour intensive, but the rewards are many and delicious to sample. Sometimes the gardening students even find time for a well earned break in the most unconventional of places. The Rose Garden is situated on a slope just beside the old orangery and it's perfect for cultivating roses. Due to the harsh climate in Sweden, the garden mostly grows bush roses which are hardier. Sweden encompasses hardiness zones which range from US Zone 2A to 8B. Stockholm, where this garden is situated, is in Zone 7. Looking at a catalogue of the roses grown here, I notice many albiforms, including Rosa Celeste, a beauty that I grow back home in Ireland. The garden supports several herbaceous borders, some very naturalistically planted and others more formal and manicured. Alliums, martigan lilies and herbaceous peonies really stand out as signature plants. Peonies are well loved all around Stockholm where they're grown in private and public gardens. There are grapevines too and the wine that's produced is called biodynamic wine. The production doesn't include any chemical additives only the heat from the sun and nourishment from the earth. Today, seven different grapes are cultivated. All of them are planted around the orangery and most of the vines come from the Baltic. Another beautiful part of the garden is the orchard. Many choose to bring their meals from the cafe out here to enjoy. 
During the heyday of the Swedish Garden Society, there were nearly 400 apple trees in the fruit garden. Historically, Rosendahl's fruit garden played an important role in the spread of heritage fruit trees within Sweden. The Garden Academy used to supply free plants to farmers and horticultural establishments. In the orchard, I spot a European red squirrel frolicking about. The red squirrel is found in both coniferous forests and temperate broadleaf woodlands. At home in Ireland, red squirrel populations have decreased in recent years. It's the same story in Britain and Italy. This decline is associated with the introduction by humans of the eastern grey squirrel from North America. But the red squirrel really is a cutie. Before we leave the Rosendahl garden, let's take a little look inside the nursery shop. The quality of the midsummer Nordic light is highlighted in here as it travels through the glass, revealing an airy space full of botanic treasures. It'd be a terrible shame to come away from my visit to the Rosendahl garden without a little memento, and seeds will fit easily into my bag. I choose some annual flowers in dusky plum colours. Cosmos, poppies, rudbeckia and an unusual double cosmos. Subscribe to the channel to see me sow these in my greenhouse next spring. And now, as a palate cleanser, before we take a look at the next garden, I'd like to take you on a little walk in the Swedish countryside here at Djurgården. In Stockholm, Sweden's capital city, over half of the municipal area is green space. These green spaces include woods and wild areas, not just grassy parks with lawn. We have now wandered out of the Rosendahl garden and find ourselves surrounded by countryside with no one else around. There are paths, however, so we're not talking complete wilderness. While a whopping 83% of Sweden's forest land is coniferous forest, we are quite far south here, so there are broadleaf trees too. I notice many birch trees, elder, European mountain ash, beech and oak. It's interesting how the birch trees get so corky as they age here. The understory to the trees includes grasses, ground elder, lily of the valley, harebell and wild strawberries, tiny little ones. One thing that really struck me was the lack of brambles. At home, any area like this would be matted with blackberry brambles, making the undergrowth impenetrable. At first, I thought that perhaps it's too cold for blackberries to grow in Sweden, but then I spotted a few young canes. Blackberries do grow in the southernmost counties of Sweden, and they must therefore survive the winter because the blackberry is a biennial and only sets flower, fruit and seed in its second year. So I'm not really sure why there aren't more brambles, except that maybe the harsh winter does reduce the numbers. There's a short window of growing time in Sweden's summer, but there's lots to enjoy during that time, including the incredible quality of Nordic light. The light is really magical. Our second garden is the one surrounding the Drottningholm Palace, which we are visiting on Midsummer's Eve. The enormous castle was built in the 1600s and is home to the Swedish royal family. It's on the UNESCO World Heritage List. The rooms in the southern wing of the palace are reserved for the royal family, but you can visit the rest of the castle. 
While you may pay to see the palace, it's free to wander around the extensive gardens. This is a common theme I noticed in Stockholm. So many open green spaces are available for people to enjoy for free. There was already a garden at Drottningholm during the time of King Johan III in the late 16th century, but the Baroque garden dates from the late 17th century. It was created under the initiative of Queen Hedwig Eleonora and it's next to the palace. It's surrounded by four rows of lime trees. The architects took their inspiration from the newly planted palace gardens of France, where the ideal was strict, ordered and symmetrical. In addition to the rows of lime trees, the Baroque garden includes the embroidery parterre or parterre de broderie, which is closest to the palace. It has eight grass rectangles today, but originally was bordered by herbaceous plants, bulbs, lilacs and trimmed conifers, making profuse floral extravaganzas. The flower beds were edged by box hedging in intricate designs. By 1810, tastes had changed and the grass rectangles in the parterre were created to replace the original flower borders. The most lavish part of the Baroque garden was the water parterre. It had the Hercules fountain at its centre and 12 smaller fountains around it. There are also cascades. The gardens, unfortunately, especially the fountains, fell into disrepair over time, but were finally restored and in some cases recreated in the 1950s. There are buildings on the grounds of the palace too. This is the exotic Chinese Pavilion Pleasure Palace Complex. It includes the Confidence. The Confidence is a dining room building where the dining table is fixed on a lift device. The table was set on the floor below by the servants and on a given signal was hoisted up through the floor. This meant that the royals could eat their dinner without the presence of servants. Another building is the aviary, which held colourful birds such as parrots. When Gustav III took over Drottningholm in 1777, he wanted to introduce the latest trend in park design from England, the Natural Landscape Park. The English park consists of two ponds with canals, islands and beautiful bridges, large lawns, groves and tree-lined avenues. Pathways meander through the park, which also has walkways offering views and panoramas across the countryside. Today there are several large wildflower meadows in this area. And on Midsummer's Eve, this is the perfect place for a midsummer picnic and Swedish families come prepared. Many have carts to transport their extensive picnic hampers. Midsummer foods include pickled herring served with new potatoes, chives and sour cream. Flavoured unsweetened schnapps are also drunk. While some people engage in more casual picnics, others go all out bringing tables, tablecloths, chairs and wine glasses. Some don the traditional midsummer flower wreath, which I saw many people wearing. It's lovely to see this, but unfortunately I missed out on the maypole dancing. And that brings me to the end of this video about two very distinctive Swedish gardens in midsummer. I really love this idea of celebrating the midsummer because we celebrate things in very drab months in winter and in autumn, but it, I think it's just lovely to embrace the heat and the joy of, of summer, which they do in Sweden. 
do you celebrate? Perhaps you have some distinctive things that you do. And if so, let me know, drop a comment down below. I do feel inspired and I think that maybe next summer at Dwensa Garden, I might do something a little special to mark the occasion. Well, I guess that's all for the moment. Thank you as always for watching and I will see you on the next video. Bye.